Hello and welcome to season two of the Voltcast, a running podcast where I talk to professional athletes, event organizers, and much more. On this week's episode, we're joined by Nick Kershaw, founder of Impact Marathon, an events organization that hosts running events across the world that aim to have a positive impact on the planet, whether that be through community projects, running, and so much more. It was great to get an insight into what makes these sorts of events happen. If you're interested in signing up to an Impact Marathon event, please visit impactmarathon.com to see what they have in offer. Without further ado, here's Nick Kershaw. Let's jump in to the vault. So welcome, Nick, to the vault cast. Um, Can you just uh, give an introduction to uh, yourself? Yes, yeah, so my name is Nick Kershaw, um, and I'm the founder CEO of Impact Marathon Series, which I started in 2015 um, as a way of bringing running uh, to a different level in terms of social impact and what we can do as runners uh, to impact the communities, learn more about where we're running, and uh, just connect people and, yeah, just transition a little bit into a race that's kind of not a race and just go out there and have a lot of fun and do a lot of good. Uh, and experience places in a new way. And so we started that in 2015. And since then, we set up races in Nepal, Guatemala, Malawi, Kenya, Jordan, and the Isle of Mull in Scotland, um, which was a, which is our newest race in the series, which is quite exciting. Yeah, so um, obviously you've touched on a bit of what Impact Marathon is, but what does it mean to you and what's its purpose and its uh, goal? What does it mean to me? Well, I've got it tattooed on my calf, so I guess quite a lot. Um, <laughs> It's been my, it's been, you know, it's been my life uh, for these seven years and not just in, you know, anyone who, who runs their own organization knows this, like it's, it's all encompassing. But um, I think, I guess a good example of that is, is these last few months, right? So obviously we were hit massively by, by the last two years, three years of, and it's been really super tough to keep it going, keep it alive, but also just that element of, you know, I'm, I'm born to do this. This is like my absolute life dream and life's work. And for two years, I wasn't able to do what I what I'm born to do, right? And 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 that was really tough. And coming into we had two races in three weeks: Nepal and then Jordan. And Nepal was a brand new location in terms of we we that's been our original race, but we moved to a new village, a much more challenging kind of location to put on a race. And then Jordan was our first Jordan race. We've been planning it since 2019, and we went you know back to back to to two of those events in three weeks. And I went into it pretty nervous pretty um i guess a, a bit of match fitness but also you know knowing the the challenges we're facing and have faced as an organization to continue you know growing and i was like there was a part of my brain which was going how how do we do this in 2023 do i do i still you know do i do i still want to be doing this and those are two of the best events we've ever done nepal i think was the best impact week we've ever put together and now everything's just rejuvenated because just the people that come on our trips are just so extraordinary. The group, the way it blends together, the way we, we put people into just places they could never go in any other way. And you just see people react and respond and grow and build. And then you see that community come together. And um, then you see the impact it makes in those communities. And I think as well, like I'd, I'd, I'd maybe over two years of not getting to visit our communities, I'd forgotten how much it, excitement there is when the race comes to town and the difference it actually makes in each of those communities as well so there's just so many different levels to it um and um i feel i feel more uh, in a, like a very kind of sterically calm way i feel more excited and energized for what we're going to do in 2023 than i have since since 2015 to be honest okay so um obviously people come to impact marathon to obviously race in fantastic locations across the world but also what really struck me about Impact Marathon was that there's something extra that you bring to the community. Um, you do projects such as like, uh, I think there was one where you laid five kilomo- uh, kilometers of water pipe. Yeah. Um, was, it, was that, I think that was in Nepal. Yeah, so, so can that you was just, Nepal year one, yeah. Yeah, can you just, uh, I don't know, kind of summarize what else you do? Um, what else we do, yeah. I mean, whilst, you know, whilst on these trips. Each, each country is slightly different in what they sort of offer, right? That that five kilometer water pipeline was the first event I'd ever put on. I had 120 runners and 120 villagers all out there for two days building this this 
pipeline that brought water to the village all year round. I look back now and like, blinking heck, how did we, how did we pull that one off? That, that, you know, but that was also a very specific and, and almost, almost too perfect project. It's been, you know, it's, it, you can't, you can't always get that. That's the hardest part about what we do, right? Because um, it's very easy to go into a country and do something good, paint a wall, pat your back, all of those things. Um, but doing something that's genuinely impactful, but also tells a story for the runners and tells the story of the community and puts the community in a position where they're in charge of the narrative um, is is incredibly hard. Um, and that's kind of where we spend, it's where I get most worried, it's where I get most intensely interested. Um, it's why in lockdown, um, I did my master's in international development because I really wanted to like go to another level of understanding of how to do this. But in other countries, um, so in Jordan, we just worked in some of the refugee camps. So Jordan, um, the population about, um, about 20% of the population is refugees from Syria, from Palestine, um, and, and from you know the other co conflicts in the surrounding areas. And they've always had an open door policy on refugees, which means you've got just outside Amman, the capital of Jordan, you've got 120,000 people uh, in uh, essentially a small town. I mean, it's not a refugee camp as, as you would picture it, right? Yeah. It's, it's structures on land. Um, and we were building rooftop gardens there, which is a super, you know, when you use permaculture techniques to use to, to rooftop gardens, you essentially take it from having to water it twice a day to having to water it twice a month in some of the most hot and arid conditions in the entire world, um, which in a country which has the sort of second most water scarcity in the world. This is now a really exciting project because families and communities are able to be self-sustaining using a lot less water, more nutritious food, um, and uh, then as well being able to sell the excess, which drives more money into, into the communities, all of these things, right? So that's a really beautiful project because it hits so many different areas. Yeah, so obviously these are quite uh, kind of small scale projects that you engage in. How yeah. do you see the, this as something bigger? I know you, um, online you've kind of spoken about how um, you've got the UN global goals that you want to. Yeah. You want to I think uh, you personally said, I want to walk into the UN and say, this is what the running community has done. So how do you see, yeah. the, how do you see these small projects changing kind of the global landscape? Yeah, so it's a really great question. I really like that question. Um, I, the global goals were set up by the UN in, in New York, right? And everyone agreed on them, everyone signed them. And then they, they announced them to the world. And that's great. And, but we saw with the Millennium Development Goals, you know, those goals didn't, they weren't effective. Not enough people knew about them, not enough uh, people understood them. And I still see that today, right? If you went into any office and just said, cool, what does sustainable cities and communities mean as a global goal, right? People will come up with some ideas. Like, now, now walk into a now walk into a village in Malawi and ask that same question. Those ideas are going to be pretty different, um, or just on a different take and a different angle. So each of these goals means something different around the world. And they're, they're, you're absolutely right. They're massive goals. Um, there's so many different metrics feeding into these goals. So what we really, for, with impact specifically, we're just saying we're, we're going cool. What does no poverty look like in? A Malawi and fishing village. What does gender equality look like in Guatemala? Um, what does it mean to this community? And so those runners coming on our trips, and many of them work in all sorts of different places. Um, you know, there's a real impact in people understanding the world or seeing the world through different eyes and going back. And we've seen huge changes in people's lives after the events, whether that's cool, I'm going to change my company policy on this, or whether that's I'm going to set up a, a girls running group in my town, or whether that's like the ongoing donations and support, they've ended up like really becoming engaged with the organizations that we support. Um, or whether that's just being in a pub and telling people, hold on, like, when you're talking about Guatemalan immigrants into the USA, you got to understand the history behind that, the history from the 1970s. You've got to see that there's a push-pull factor and that, that immigrants in the USA actually are hugely important to driving the economy of the USA. And there's a rhetoric from Washington that doesn't matter. Like all of these things. Now, I'm so, I, it's a super technical, it's a running podcast. Uh, so, um, but like, my, my, you know, there, there's so many different elements to it. But I think our thing of, of grassroots is saying, cool, let's, let's cut, out, cut out all of the middle talk. Let's cut out the narratives um, that others put on it, even impact, you know, my narrative as a, a British middle class male, um, we've told a lot of stories over the over, over many centuries, right? It's not my time to continue that narrative, right? It's time for to put 
are, are organizers front and centers. That's why we use videographers that are in the community, right? That's why we don't fly in people to do all these things. Like we, we really want those stories to be um, lifted up by the communities themselves. So it's taking those big goals set up in a New York office and making them grassroots, making them understandable, making them tangible. And then through the stories we can tell through our media, and then also through the stories you can tell from each one of our runners and as well, the runners in each country, you know, the, the runners here in Guatemala City don't necessarily interact on a, on a very regular basis with other elements of, of Guatemala. Each country has different sides and actually yeah. the stories we have permeate through not just our international runners, but our local runners as well. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting the way you were talking about Guatemala specifically, because uh, you, you don't know this, but I studied Latin American history at university. So <laughs> I understand completely the way uh, in which a lot of Latin American countries play into the economics, um, specifically mm -hmm. in the USA. So I think that's just um, really cool that, like you said, you're breaking down this barrier of I'm a white middle class male. This is what I see um, through my lived experience. But it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's finding out what their lived experience is as well and become, like coming to terms with a lot of white middle class males but, don't but, but, actually but know. Not, yeah, well. but not in a not in a sort of I always talk about it and we talk about it in the team of like yeah. sometimes there's some really uncomfortable things. And exactly, yeah. Our job is not to punch someone in the face. Our job <laughs> is to go, cool. I've been here enough, I've yeah. I've, you know, and, yeah. and you know, we we're taking on some really huge discussions and so like, you know, just just three weeks ago we were in a Palestinian refugee camp, right? This is a huge this is the most sort of I guess controversial mm. area that we've ever you know taken on as impact and yeah. you know what the most powerful story that can be told there was the lunch that we had put on by by the community that tells you more about palestinian culture palestinian history palestinian than anything you can read or anything we can say or any vocabs or words that we can we can we can use to like no and so there's a lot of lot of ways to bring stories to life that isn't yeah isn't even through words and mm. by letting the community show exactly. their story their narrative and yeah. at that point i'm i'm a passenger as well I'm, I'm i'm with the runners i don't know like when we do those impact days i've been involved in understanding what's going to happen but yeah. i have no idea and i always say like the first 15 20 minutes is always gently awkward it just is yeah and then rhythm starts and it flows and, and we see this time and time again but you know how how a running race can combine to be something that's a, a just a genuinely powerful and beautiful narrative that helps with mm. understanding that that's a pretty uh a pretty fun career choice for me i would say like yeah. it, it, it shouldn't blend right but yeah it seems to blend really well and obviously it's it's a really unique aspect of what impact marathon is and i think obviously your title impact marathon you're making an impact through uh running so why did you choose the running community itself Obviously, we've spoken before, like you said, you're, you're a runner yourself, you're a Salomon ambassador. Yeah. But yeah. what was it that thought, you know what, I'm going to bring the running community to these places? Well, I, I, I was training for an Ironman. I was doing Ironman Wales in 2014, feels like a years ago now. Um, and I had some projects in Uganda at the time, just a sort of thing I was doing on the side. I was working a normal sort mm -hmm. of finance job, and, <clears throat> but I was running. I love running. Um, I am more into running than any of the other forms of forms of sport within the triathlon. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I just, it just so happened that when we were talking about our projects and saying, you know, I, I really believed if, if you look at London marathon, for example, you know, a lot yeah. of funds like 40 million pounds raised through London marathon. It's incredible. Um, but, but I wanted to just sort of go an extra thing and say like, when people donate to a friend and they put the credit card away, that's usually the end of the story. And I think that should be the start of the story. That money goes somewhere. It has a story. It touches people's lives. It changes people's lives. You can go down a sort of cynical view and go, well, I'd like to know where my, my charity money goes. And that, that's perfectly legitimate. But I, I personally sort of go down the view of, cool, I want to show you where it goes. And there's this like slight mm. difference of, 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 of empowering tone of going, I, 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 I really want to show people the impact they've had. We all, we, you know, if we just use Britain's example, cause that's probably going to be the sort of main yeah. listeners to, to this, this pod at the moment. It's like in Britain, you know, at the moment there's so many different challenges going on, right? So many difficult moments, so many, uh, but also we're all still going to jobs, working our jobs. Some people love their jobs. 
I would hasten to say most people don't. And actually, when you donate to great organizations, you're, you're, it gives something to your life that has a purpose and a meaning. And so I wanted to, to take that an innate ability for marathons to be fundraising tools and bring the storytelling and bring the community and bring it so that, yeah, when people fundraise, they're fundraising because they're really inspired by what's happening. When people donate, they're really engaged in that story. And that doesn't always work. I haven't always got that right. It's an ongoing challenge that. And then yeah. when it comes to running, it's just super accessible, right? And it's just... Um, it, it breaks down barriers. It's just a natural communicator. Once you bring in, you know, uh, other elements, cycling or swimming, you've now started to, to mean that less of the community we're in can be involved. Um, bikes cost a lot of money in our communities, right? Swimming, actually, a lot of people don't have a swim. Um, so running, if you can't run, you, you, you can walk. And we have this all the time with yeah, elderly guys in the community joining in our races and, and they'll walk and they'll run walk. And, um, it's just super, it's a super, super accessible um, sport that just has this power to unite because as runners, like, and it doesn't matter whether, you know, so many people on this podcast that I've listened to, you know, these are elite runners, but yeah. every single one of them knows that moment where your brain goes, ooh, 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 stop it. You can't do this anymore. But you know what? The person at the back has that as well. And every single runner who's ever run knows that voice of, ooh, you, you can't do this, mate. And we all know how it is feels when you ignore it. And we also, most of us know how it feels when you listen to it. And, and yeah. And so that element is just such a unifying power in the running community. And everyone's running for their different motivations, different reasons. And it's just a very beautiful community. And, and with Impact, we just wanted to bring a different level, a different idea, a different concept and challenge some of the preconceptions of what running yeah. races should be and, um, and what travel should be. Yeah, I, I think that's, even if we bring it back to like a, a smaller scale you can see it at a park run every mm -hmm. week people show 100%. up and um on on the last episode that's just just gone out today um we were speaking about there's this man in my local park run and he runs it every single week and he's constantly getting faster but he's always finishing last but everyone yeah. knows his name and everyone stands around and s waits until he crosses the line and cheers him on and he obviously loves the attention but <laughs> is that is that part it's of amazing. it like that just this one guy doing his 5k park run brings the whole of our town together to actually yeah. cheer this guy on and i think that's that's the one thing that the running community is so powerful is you're just kind of overwhelmed by someone's achievement um, yeah and it's not always your own achievement sometimes you cross the line and you're like oh didn't get my pb what a shame sort of thing i'll, I'll try harder next time but seeing these other people who perhaps haven't run all their lives or yeah. I think he was saying he's had a hip replacement recently and he's still running yeah. and it's, it's learning like, like you said, people's stories and knowing what goes into them that really kind of unifies us. Um, as a Yeah. And you don't know what's going through other people's heads. Like yeah. how, there's times when you finish and someone comes up like, thanks for pacing me that final. I wasn't pacing. I was, <laughs> I was in my own world, but yeah, exactly. But, you know, people know that that's a, mm. and and or you sit and you chat and you run at the same time. And I think, um, yeah, there, there, there's no barrier to that in any event, right? And I think, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, there's one really one of the sort of form like key moments in terms of forming that idea around Impact Marathon was in 2015 running in Pyongyang in North Korea, right? And it's a four lap race, um, and on the first lap all the kids are hiding behind their parents. They're super nervous. They're super like, mm. yeah, there's a lot of Westerners running around Yang. This is, this is quite a scary moment for a kid. And by the fourth lap, they're running with you. They're high-fiving you. They're giving you bananas. And that element of like, when you see someone putting themselves through a moment of suffering or through that pain of like, I can't do this, but I'm going to keep going. Yeah. Humanity barriers and borders are broken down at that moment because it just connects you and you just like i, I want to help you i want to cheer you on i want to mm. say the right word or i want to give you some food or and that's seen in every city around the world where there's uh, you know a run or a race every town every community it just brings people together so for yeah. me that that's the really powerful bit about using running over over any other sport that we could use yeah so what actually goes into organizing an event? Obviously, there's tons of moving parts <laughs> in a normal race, let alone um, an impact marathon race. Yeah. Um, so obviously, a lot of listeners um, will have no clue. They just probably turn up to most events and think, oh, it's all laid on a table and you just kind of do the race and then you go home afterwards. 
but obviously mm. there's so much more um that goes on behind the scenes can you just give us like a brief <laughs> um, maybe i'm in a corner gently sobbing to myself no um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah just kind of a brief of what you have yeah. to do behind the scenes to just actually get to the start line I, it's, it's really hard to answer that question because it's so normalized in my life now that mm. um picking it out is different so i'm just gonna kind of let's think through um Nepal, right? Because that was a new community that we were working in. Or, or let, no, let's do something different. Let's do Scotland, because that was a really good example of how many different okay. things are up in the air, right? So we're on the Isle yeah. of Mal. Um, Isle of Mal's not easy to get to. It's a 45 minute ferry from the mainland. Um, if things aren't on the island, then then it, sometimes it was harder to solve things on the Isle of Mal than it was in a remote Kenyan village, right? So, um, but in that time, we'd basically, the Scotland race, we condensed into just two main days, like an arrival day, two main days, then a departure day. And, um, you know, at this time on the, on the, on the first day, we were working with Trees Not Tees um, and the Future Forest Organization, which is like, uh, and, and their estate up on the Isle of Mull, where they're, they're building in sort of really progressive concepts around land management, as well as, re, uh, you know, reforestation, um, but as well as making sure that land is still productive, it's still sustainable, it's still, you know, uh, that story was being told. Uh, throughout the day on the Saturday. So in the build up, we took this uh, really beaten up uh, farm. Um, there had been, you know, when Future Forests uh, acquired it, it had been 15 years where it hadn't, nothing had been going on, right? And then they've acquired it, they started to build towards it, but now there's, you know, 150 people coming to live on it. So we were like, one day I spent the entire day clearing out a pigsty and making it into a pop-up shop. Um, we had the old dairy was being uh, made into a sort of a little bar area. The barn was going to be a cinema. So all of this storytelling that was going to happen was happening all over the estate, trying to work out how to uh, plan all of that. You know, even Portaloos is super difficult. Well, it's not as easy because Portaloos has got to come from the mainland. And all of this, right? So all of this is going on. We're clearing the field of, 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 of anything that could be hazardous. We're building the site, but all at the same time, we're planning out a race route over here. And on the Saturday, we've got 150 people planting trees, uh, pulling out trees that are not indigenous and therefore invasive. So learning about like actually how land management works is not mm. a tree in itself is not a, necessarily a good thing. You need the right trees in the right places, this or there. Then we've got some lectures going on in the barn. So all of this is moving around, right? And at the same time, I'm getting phone calls from the guys out on the course who are marking the course being like, that section's now, you know, not going to work. So we're going to move this way. And, you know, and then as soon as like all of the, that had finished, it was everyone into the barn where I give the race briefing. Uh, and then after that, there's the food that's getting pulled out. And so all the food's included in that, in that weekend as well. So we've got all of the menu, how we're planning that. But, the, you know, the menu's not just called cool, burgers and chips. Like the menu is like, how do we tell a story through that food? So every single thing has this different story and it's all wearing around. So, okay, cool. There's, the leaks haven't turned up, so we're going to have to change that soup. Um, all of this is going on. Um, and then, yeah, you wake up on race day morning and you still, you've got a trail race. You've got to roll out. You've got to get make sure the volunteers are in the right place at the right time. Um, one volunteer gets nah, Nepal. Um, we had a load of uh, a group of people coming up from Kathmandu to race in Kathmandu, and um, sorry, to race race up in our village. Yeah. And they someone had just parked a big caterpillar JCB type thing on the middle of the road overnight because no one uses this road because it's a one trail to one village that no car goes up. So yeah. now they're having to dig around there to go. You know, this is all you're constantly adapting as well as the as the new information comes into you and making decisions. And so. Um, it, it, the, the annoying thing is it's totally addictive and once you you've been on the team for one of our events like it's so frustrating you can't resist it you can't i can't go to you know i, I love love trails festival down in the gower right amazing yeah. festival put on by you know theo and, and sarah and rich and i can't go there and not help them right i can't <laughs> i can't be at a normal event and just just run it no i have to be like cool what do you need how can you help that because it's just it's, it's just that there is no more stimulating thing um and there's times even in races. I remember one year in Guatemala. Guatemala is a live volcano, and um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into the risk assessments on that, and what happens if X, Y, Z, and all these different things. It's also super technical four by fouring to get around the course. So I, I, it's, it's a dream day for me, driving an amazing like you know around and getting to different points of the course and making sure it's all safe. I mean, there was one year where it was just going so smoothly, and everything was in the right place. The runners were having the best time. Everyone was coming past, sweaty hugs, smiles, loving it. 
And there was just this weird, sick, twisted part of my brain that popped up and went, I kind of want a challenge today. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, fortunately, nothing happened. It was a really boring day for me. Um, from a from a challenge perspective, and you're just like, cool. It is better that way. But yeah. when you're so prepared for for so many different things, and you know how good you are at doing this, and you know how good your team is at doing this, mm. there is a part of your brain that's like, cool. I can I can handle it. Come on, throw it at yeah. me. But you're yeah, always exactly. pleased when it doesn't happen, um, for sure. Yeah. So, um, obviously, that is just insane. I can't even think of managing all those moving parts <laughs> in my head at one single time. Um, but obviously this year you brought um, Impact to Jordan, which was a whole mm. new country and a whole new concept. Um, obviously, like you said, you were building these um, farms on top of rooftops. Um, what was the reasoning behind choosing Jordan? That's a great question. Um, we, we, we're trying to blend a few different things. So the first and most important thing is, is the social impact. Can we have a social impact in this country? Is this the country that we mm. want to... Uh, that we can tell a, a, a new narrative, an interesting narrative, a different narrative. Um, we always try and find those stories that maybe aren't the sexiest stories. They aren't, aren't, aren't the story that you're going to see on uh, on the middle of the day when you're watching Sky Sports News and you see the adverts in those breaks. It's, it's not going to yeah. be that story. It's going to be a really empowering story about the great sort of individuals in each community that are driving change. Um, we ha We also look at it from the perspective of of that spread, right? Because we've got a race in Central America, we've got a race, you know, two races in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've got, you know, the race in Central Asia. Hmm. So we wanted one that told a different narrative. And, and I think um, we wanted one that told, we, we, we I, since the beginning, I've wanted a story around, you know, a very misunderstood region in the Middle yeah. East. And we, again, we, we've seen that again in the last month, more than ever before in terms of um, a, an overarching media narrative. Um, that potentially doesn't take into account uh, culture, history, um, our own role as Britain in the region, um, these sorts of things. We wanted to tell that different story. And, and Jordan's open door policy in terms of like, we, you know, we, we're we here for refugees. We're, we're going to be open to that. Um, it was just a really interesting narrative, um, as well as a country that is incredibly cool to, to visit and a, a country that some people's, a lot of people's bucket lists. Um, so the first, the most important thing is, is can we have a social impact? Then the next story behind it is, do you people want to go to this country? Um, is this some, something that would interest and excite people? And then the final one is, is can we do a cool race route? And um, when we can hit all of those three things, uh, sometimes there's a lot of infrastructure. Sometimes like in Nepal, we have to build everything ourselves. And we do this yeah. whole pop-up athletes village from nothing um, up in the Himalayas, right? Um, Jordan's slightly different, right? It's got a lot of infrastructure for this size of group and, and all of that. So we're able to do it. Okay, cool. New challenges. How do we do this in a way that you, you wouldn't be able to do in any other way, right? And yeah. um, how do we tell, you know, Jordan is this like, we wanted to show three sides to Jordan, really. You know, the one side is like normal everyday life for Jordanians, right? So we started and we were um, in central Amman, and our first project was a community center within central Amman, right? Then we wanted to show as well the the, the awesome tourist side. You know, it's the first time we've ever done something as touristy as go to Petra, but there's so much history. I couldn't I couldn't drive past Petra and not let people go in and see no, exactly, yeah. what right? it is. Um, so, but okay, cool. We're going to do that. How are we going to do it differently? Well, any tour group has to start at eight o'clock. So how do we do it so that we can start at 6.30 and get in there early? And, 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 you know, we took quite a lot of challenges and negotiations and all that, but eventually we managed to say, cool, we are allowed in at 6.30 and we went and we had the treasury to ourselves for 20 minutes. It's super, super cool of doing it from a unique angle, right? So, um, but we wanted to show that, that amazing, stunning, wow side of travel as well, but just do it in a way that's not formulaic and, you know, shows a different side. Right? Yeah. And then the final side was, was the side that doesn't really get talked about in Jordan ever. And that's the refugee side. And, and for a country that's made up so much um, of refugees um, and has had such a, a policy and has stayed, you know, um, uh, stayed as a peaceful nation uh, in the Middle East um, to some degree. I don't want to overstate that one. Um, mm. I, I, I think we wanted to show that side. And, and you know, the, the, our partners on the race, he said, you know, 32 years of working in, like, I've never seen a group come and go, cool, we want to go to refugee camp. We want to, we want to engage in that in that side of this country. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really proud of that. Yeah, 
I, I think this is really interesting because not too long ago, I actually had um, a Jordanian marathoner called Moaf uh, Al Khawaiyadi, and he's yeah. he's a two eighteen marathoner, um, and he's also been named one of the top forty influential runners. I'm not sure if you ever heard of him, but he is. Yes, I I, ch- I chatted to him in 2017. Oh I was, wow! I, I, when we were first coming up with the idea of Jordan, he was giving me advice on locations and ideas. I actually really need to touch base with him again. Yeah, really well, you should because um, yeah. I actually. <laughs> I, I recently went out to um, Sam Maritz whilst he was training out there. Mm. And we, we, we trained together and um, uh, and um, cool. we, we, we spoke a lot about how Jordan is misunderstood, like mm-hmm. primarily, especially in Western countries, because the only thing that the news shows is the violence. Um, and that's such a small part of what Jordan is. And I, I mean, I even, I think if I mentioned it to anyone in my family and said, oh, I, I'm I'm thinking of going on a trip to Jordan. They they would probably turn around and be like, um, "Why?" <laughs> but yeah. is but the I I think the thing is is like especially with Impact Marathon is it show it you need to show this different side of what the normal narrative is. Um, yeah, and I think and I'm I'm not sure if you've heard this YouTube channel called Yes Theory. But they do such yes, a great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do such a great way. They go to Afghanistan. They go to all these places that are obviously yeah. kind of played with violence, but also they show the re- that there is a human aspect to it. And I think also like Completely. obviously Jordan, it it has had its troubles, but compared to some other countries, it's actually a lot better. Um, but yeah, so I mean, kind of linking back to the political. Uh, side of things i think yeah. you know what's, what's coming here in nepal uh you most recently uh, <laughs> on your instagram you talked about your achievements of um hosting uh an impact <laughs> marathon during a national election in nepal now for the viewers who don't know um nepal's got quite a lot of political instability at the moment uh especially with its neighboring countries um and their impact on nepal so why was that such um, a brilliant achievement for yourselves as Impact Marathon? So in Nepal, you know, as you mentioned, it's landlocked between India and China. So this is already super, the northern border is shared with Tibet, right? This is, this is a really interesting, but it's got thousands of years of independence. The, the British tried, definitely tried to, to change that and didn't. Um, it has a huge level. It has 123 or 132 different languages and different tribes. It also has sort of an informal caste system that's illegal, but still sort of relevant in society, particularly amongst the elders. Um, you then got uh, the constitution was ratified in 2015. So this is the only the second time that you've had uh, an election, a full election since the constitution. Yeah. Um, you also had a 10 year insurgency ballot by the Maoists. Um, during during the, the early 2000s so all of this plays into the fact that actually there isn't a massive system towards how an election is run now what that means is like our our our, our election is uh, our, our democracy is how many hundreds years old imagine our democracy was only 10 years old um you'd still be learning like how does the voting system work how are the rules are? and so for 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 this there was clear rules right and and one of those clear rules was you know on the election day which is the sunday our race day was saturday on election day the roads are closed like no one is no one is moving around um nepalis weren't even able to unless you're walking to vote you couldn't be out on the streets right so we had to pack down our entire setup which was up north in the hills away from Kathmandu. As the race was going on, we were packing everything down so that we could be on a bus that night all the way back to Kathmandu so we could wake up on Sunday morning in Kathmandu without the need to have to transport ourselves down when, when that was clearly not going to be possible, right? A bus, yeah. we, you know, it just wasn't possible, right? So th- there's that. But there's also just, okay, cool. In the build up to it, no political events are allowed. Okay, does a race count as a political event? You know, we went to the election committee. Oh, well, you know. Children aren't allowed to be. Involved. Our start finish line was a school, and they were saying, "Well, children aren't allowed to be involved in a political event." Well, it's not a political event, you know. This is a, a you know. So yeah. all of that negotiation and permissions and all of this, coupled with yeah, just things weren't sure. Like on the third, what was it? Yeah, on the Wednesday, um, the school 
uh, you know, we've been working and volunteering at the school all day and the school, okay, cool. We've been told it's a national holiday for all schools tomorrow. And that was at four o'clock. At seven o'clock, I got a call from one of the teachers that said, hey, by the way, um, that's changed. We are going to be at school tomorrow. There is no national, that, that, yeah. And also, how is this moving around? You know, we're talking about a country yeah. where, you know, th this information is spreading back and forth, back and forth. So that uncertainty um, was more of an issue. It ended up passing off without, without a single hitch. It was great. And, wow. and if in, in some ways the election did us a bit of a favor, but yeah, we didn't publicize the race down in Kathmandu at all. You know, the mm. hardcore trail runners, they all came up because they love impact and they were like, well, we're going to be there. Don't worry. Um, yeah. But we didn't publicize it later. So we couldn't, you know, obviously we do, we do charge for expats and that to, to join our races. So we, we lost, we lost a bit of, cash on that respect in terms of how we deliver the event and, and our costs, but okay, fine. You know, that, money, you know, that, that's part and part of it. But it's more just about, okay, cool. Can our Nepali team be up in the village on the Saturday or do they now need to return? And uh, yeah, lots of people were, you know, we couldn't get a chef because actually the chefs are all involved in the political rallies and all this sort of stuff. And they have a, the, the cooks union is one of the strongest unions in that there's so many different things here. Like I hope yeah. everyone's taking notes. We'll do a quick exam at the end. But like <laughs> the, the, the unions, this turns out the cooks union is one of the strongest unions, one of the most important for political parties to, to get. So there weren't any cooks around, right? So how do you cook for all of our guys in, in the village? And so all of this sort of stuff. And we managed to keep on sort of pushing through and pushing through. But yeah, we were, we were buying tents and, and we, we, bought, we were invested in some big safari tents to put up in the village. And, um, you know, our tent guy was like, look, you've got to order on Monday because the government orders are going to come in later in the week. And if they come yeah. in, I have to put all of my canvas towards the marquees for the election. So suddenly you have to make a split, like a really quick decision on, okay, cool, we need, we're need going to need to do this. How many do we need? Like all of these kind of things are just being forced into, but, you know, the election. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, a, it, it was really, we worked it through. It was great fun <laughs> behind the scenes. Um, yeah. But we all needed a good sleep after that one. Challenging, but. Yeah, definitely hard. It's what makes it so addictive. It comes back to this. Yeah. It's like, I, I, it I absolutely love it. I, I love the challenge. And I, I also, I said this to the runners. I said, you know, you can either, you know, we're going to, there may be some times when we're going to say, cool, we're changing this plan because the election. And you're going to have to accept that, right? But you can either accept it through grit, gritted teeth or you can go, cool, this is really interesting to be in a, in yeah. a really new democracy, see how it works. How does the logistics work? The count takes two, three weeks because you've got all of these remote villages and all of that's getting sent back and understanding and learning and, and, and giving a different angle and appreciation for the countries, you know, that the, you know, not all of our, not all of our runners come from democratic countries, but you know, the challenges to it. Um, I just, I think it's genuinely a really interesting way of understanding and learning a country in a different way. And if you were to do a normal trip and just go trekking in, in Nepal, which is a great thing to do, then you would be completely unaware of all these things going on. But when you're, you're living in a village that, you know, no tourists would ever normally pass through, you get to see a totally different angle yeah, of, of, of how, how politics work. Yeah. So, um, I think you touched on this earlier, but kind of with your events obviously they happen all across the world um there's ob obviously tons of moving parts as we've spoken about before um but obviously covid must have had a huge impact on impact marathon itself yeah. because you can no longer travel anywhere um i yeah. mean it, it hit the whole running industry quite hard but obviously the biggest part of yours was travel so how did you adapt? Did you completely close down impact um, pretty much throughout this time? Yeah. And kind of how did you adjust to yeah, so, it, coming out know, of a pandemic life sort of thing? It was pretty horrible, right? Um, yeah, I, I furloughed and all of these kind of things and you yeah. just sort of battened down the hatches and found your way through. We went from a team of six to a team of one. Um, and this year has been rebuilding that mm. with just, just myself, right? So, so I've gone into this year with uh like really awesome volunteers and sort of um temporary team for each race to make it happen um and that's been really hard you know there's so many different moving parts and actually this year most of it has been relying solely on on, on myself which you know has been difficult from lots of perspectives mental health perspectives as much as anything um and just having to rebuild again you know i spent five years building building the organization to be a sustainable organization and that's where we got to in 2020 yeah. so to then have to basically start from from scratch again um obviously there's a lot 
of good things that we've done that, that mean it's not fully from scratch but mm. the reality is that that in terms of cash flow you know we were we were crippled by it and um uh but this year's been harder than we thought as well we've seen more people not end up coming like lots of people signed up and and then we've had a, a higher dropout rate than we had pre-pandemic um potentially that's you know there's a lot of different factors to that if you signed up in 2019 and you know now you know, you're not free in 2022 to do this or you don't want to and yeah. you're injured or you stop running or like there's so many different things so that that's present you know certainly this autumn has been really difficult from that perspective um and hopefully now we sort of cleared out that sort of pandemic sign up challenges and in 2023 we're going to go back to a sort of the normal you know 10 percent of people who sign up don't don't normally end up being able to come for some reason but then most people defer and come the year later or whatnot i think that yeah. leads really well onto the next section which is no context track um this is this was developed pretty much out of a Instagram account called No Context Track where they post images that have no context to them and it's kind of okay. like a game. You can, uh, in the comments section of it, you can kind of guess what the, the context is or you can just make a joke. Um, so, <laughs> but I, I thought I would... So there's a lot of jokes on there um, and I did, have, okay. I did have a group of athletes where I sent them their photos and they actually just had to take the piss out of each other. But um, I've decided to adapt it a bit just to make okay. it a lot more digestible for the audience. So I've sent you a photo. I think you've mm -hmm. had access to it. It's going to appear on yes. the screen now. Um, if you're watching on Spotify, uh, please head over to the YouTube channel just for this. If it's just to watch this section, because um, uh, Nick is going to walk us through uh, the photo. And for the audio listeners, can you just uh, describe what's going on in the image um, and then tell us your context okay. behind the image. Okay, right. So this is actually um, about 10 minutes running from my house um, where I live on the coast of Pembrokeshire. And uh, so I, I um, there's so much context to this picture actually, um, but I don't know where to start. So the picture is, uh, for those on, on audio, the picture is of me uh, running on the Welsh uh, coast path on the Pembrokeshire section of the Welsh coast path. And it's actually me running past my favorite little swim bay. It's two and a half kilometers. So yeah, who am I kidding? It's not 10 minutes from my house. More like 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> <It's> two... <laughs> Giving myself away there. Um, and it's a bay that, that I, uh, I swim in most mornings um, throughout the entire year. I run down, um, I swim for a little bit and I run back. Um, there's very, very rarely another soul in sight on that whole section, I think. There is so much joy on the on the, on the coast of, of Pembrokeshire that people need to need to travel down to Pembrokeshire to to run in Pembrokeshire and trail run in Pembrokeshire. Um, but also, yeah, I go out regularly and just go down there, swim, run back home. Um, I've swum with seals there. Um, I accidentally punched a jellyfish the other day there, um, which was which was pretty scary. Yeah. Um, got away with it. Um, and um, you know, in the summer, it looks like this Mediterranean clear blue. You can see the bottom of the sea. And you wouldn't believe it was the Welsh coast. In the winter, it um, uh, it can be wavy, it can be all these things, but it's always, you know, whether the tide's in or out, that bay is always swimmable, and I really like that. So the context is actually quite an interesting one from a, a running perspective. Um, you know, I've obviously gotten to go and run some of the best trails around the world, and um, in March 2020, we did our race on the 6th, 7th of March here in Guatemala, as so I'm in Guatemala at the moment. And um, we did that race, and then the day after our race, the government announced, cool, all foreigners will need to quarantine for seven days in arrival. So, but for the grace of God, right, we, we, we'd already done our event. We'd, you know, and, I, and then um, it's a week later, and suddenly the government said, we're closing down the border, and there's no flights in or out from, from Monday. My flight's on Tuesday, so I have to go and spend 24 hours at the airport. I can't get on a flight for love nor money. Um, I managed to get on the second to last flight out of Guatemala. Uh, to get home, I get to Atlanta airport and I'm sat there and I message my family group and I said, like, I've been completely remote for five years. I just go to the next race. So three months in Nepal, cool. Next race is Kenya, cool. I go live in Kenya for two months. I've been completely nomadic, living out of two bags. And um, I said, I, if I can't cross a border, go back to that white British middle class, where, you know, all of those things, if I can't cross a border, something something big that's a, a sort of canary in the in the coal mine right something something bad's happening in the world right now and it was still very early days there was no lockdown in the uk i was like i don't think i should go back to london i, I think i don't but i don't know where i should go and my mum lives on the coast of Pembrokeshire, which is like you know i've got space come here and 
you know, I got there and it's after a race, so I was super tired. I slept like five nights in a row, 13 hours a night. And that's pretty normal after the emotional toll that any race puts on me. I, I take things very deeply personally. And, and, and um, after races, I'm very, very tired. And uh, I was a bit depressed being back in Pembrokeshire. You know, this wasn't a happy place for us. It's where my parents had separated. See, you didn't know this was going to go this context, did you, right? No. It's where my parents had separated. We'd lived there when I was 18. It was like a a scene from the in-betweeners. I grew up in Guildford and, and London and my parents are saying, cool, we're moving down to the coast of Wales. I'm like, what? No, no. <laughs> and, um, you know, we lived there and then my, yeah, my parents separated and um, it became quite a painful place for our whole family. And um, I got there, blimey, what's going to happen? As we talked about earlier, the difference COVID's going to make to Impact Marathon. What do I do in my life? This has been five years. Now I'm stuck at home and back at my mum's house, all of these things. And I planned out a little route on my Cinto app and I went running and I came across this bay and I came across all the other bays on that little, it's like a six kilometer loop that I can do and I can do 20, I can, you know, you name it, I've got every trail in that area, especially yeah. within the five mile radius of the house. I know every trail because uh, of the lockdown rules. Yeah. And I just, um, I think it's some of the best trail running I've ever done and some of the best cold swimming I've ever done. And um, I've seen it in muddy, horrible rain. I've seen it in the snow. I've seen it in the summer. I've taken, you know, my brother came and visited down this summer and, uh, you know, he'd obviously lived there with us when we first moved there. And he was just like, this is like, I really, I would live here. This is amazing. I, we never knew this when we first lived here. When I was 18, when we moved there, I didn't trail run, didn't cold or swim. I didn't know how wonderful this place could be. And that bay in particular, I love taking people there. Come visit me. I'll take you there. It's just, um, it's just spectacular and and just a, a place where you smile and you run and you walk and you hike and you swim and um, and now yeah, like I think um, I think we'll be moving back there permanently to Pembrokeshire at least for for the next little while. We'll be we'll make it our base. And I never, you know, if you'd asked me in March twenty twenty, I would have probably said some pretty choice words about that part of the world. <laughs> and now I'm fully involved. I've got another. A business I'm building down there now as well mm -hmm. and uh, really passionate about the same things I am about impact about bringing more jobs to the community and yeah. keeping people with talent yeah a lot of people leave Pembrokeshire it's, it's pretty remote and I want to build more jobs down there so that people stay in their communities and that's the case in Guatemala the case in Nepal um you know these, these are these are big issues facing the global economy where people are having to leave their communities families everything like that to, to, to earn money and that I feel the same way about Pembroke shows. I feel about everywhere. It's like, cool, we, let's create jobs. Let's create industry. Let's, let's, uh, let's build communities properly. Um, instead of sort of based on a, a system where, where the only thing that matters is the economics of things. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, that's, the context. Wow. that's the context of the photo. You, you said that there should be jokes. I haven't cracked a single joke there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> everyone down. Um, there is, um, there is no, there's no more jokes. That, <laughs> that 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 was the past of no context track. We've we've kind of if built something new. If anyone can add in the comments, add in the comments a joke about that picture to just lighten the mood. Yeah, please do. We need that. <laughs> yeah, it it could be something as simple as how fast do you think he's running or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, how many times did I go back and forth <laughs> taking that photo? <laughs> I just have this image of of um, your your mum or someone in, up up there trying to take the photo, or you try running up there to set a timer and you running past. It's definitely not my mother. I've now never managed to get my mother to the secret bay. I wish I had, but um, I'll keep trying on that one. Yeah. So this this obviously just I mean that was amazing. Um, but yeah. In the comments below, uh, just try and give a different type of context to what Nick is. Um, doing in this photo um, <laughs> moving on anyway <laughs> quite swiftly um, if you were stranded on a desert island mm. I think this I, I, I feel I have a feeling you'll have a really good answer to this because you've, you've traveled everywhere you're, you're quite <sighs> nomadic already so and you were living out your final days on this um, island it can be anyone throughout history who you're on this island with fictional non-fictional who would it be and why? But it can't be Bear Grylls because we've had too many people try and say that. No, it would. It wouldn't be anyway. It wouldn't be anyway. No, I like Bear Bear, but uh, you know, no. I think he would. I think his optimism would be too annoying at that point. You know? <laughs> I'm living out my final days. I don't need that optimism. Um, you know, like it's this is a terror. I don't know. 
you you built this up to be a good answer. I, I'm can I give like a couple of ideas? Can I talk through some thinking? You can talk because I haven't yeah, got yeah, to yeah, a yeah, conclusion, and maybe an idea that I haven't had so far is gonna is gonna come out. Yeah, like I am literally nine days away from my wedding. If I don't say my wife in this scenario, then I think I've probably made a mistake. So, <laughs> first port of call. She is a non-fiction character um, in my life. <laughs> I would probably want to spend. Yeah, she is non-fiction. I promise. Um, I'd probably like to spend my last few days on a desert island with her. But I feel like that's too 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 simple an answer. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm a Christian, and um, I. But also, I don't want to give the answer to Jesus because this is my final days. I'm probably about to go meet him. Right. That's yeah. what the Bible says. Right. So I shouldn't go to Jesus. I'm going to spend eternity with him. I guess <laughs> so. Well, yeah, if I followed that line, if I was going to go with someone like Moses, who really had to like, Moses, I want to ask some questions about Moses. He, you know, he, he'd be he was really good at led. making fire as well. If he would, that would be, he's got skills. He lived in the yeah. desert he for can, 40 he years. Can part the sea. He can, there's a lot of things Moses brings yeah. to this conversation. Um, and also, he, he, was, he didn't have it easy, right? He, you know, Moses had a stutter, and, and, you know, then the Lord asked him to flip in, go and lead, be the leader of a nation. You know, that's mm. pretty impressive. I wouldn't, you know, and yeah. he had a lot. So I think Mo, someone interesting from the Bible, like Moses, would be super interesting. Um, but I don't know. Going back on the same concepts as Jesus, in theory, I'm going to meet Moses and spend a turn with Moses. But like, I don't yeah. think we expected this to take a Christian turn either. Um, who would I like to spend my dying days with? Um, I think of like, I, I think a really good thing is who is your guilty pleasure celebrity? Is there a celebrity out there? That you were like, you know what? I'm never going to meet this person, but they could actually be really interesting. Um, yeah, no, I'm a huge <laughs> Lewis Hamilton fan. Flipping, flipping that guy. Like he's so interesting. So many different things. Yeah, he's not just a driver. Um, mm. I think, um, I think, I think we'd have a laugh together. I think we'd have yeah. a laugh together. I think we would. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to go Lewis Hamilton, and Moses, and my wife. That would be a very weird yeah, combination of people on that island. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I need to listen to some more of your podcasts and find out what other people said and see how terrible my answer is in comparison to that. I don't know. We've Last week we had Peter K. Um, who else have we had? We've had people just choosing... Peter K? Yeah, Peter oh, K. Yeah. We've had people just choosing like their brother's... Uh, like friends of the family. Okay, so you, so people do yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so it doesn't yeah. have to be someone. Um, yeah, okay, cool. I'm right. trying to I'm trying to think who else. I think yeah. I I mean yeah. Go back and listen to them. Um, and you'll you'll just skip to the end. You'll be able to hear. That <laughs> don't even have to listen to everything beforehand. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> sell yourself. To it. Come yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, at least you'll get the view count up if you go through all of them and just skip to the end this and actually true. listen to the cool. end. Got you. Uh, it will yep. appear on the analytics like you've listened to the whole thing, which is good for my. Um, hopefully, one day when I. Uh, be able to monetize this stuff so but anyway i can't yeah. do that at the moment because um I need a thousand subscribers first anyway moving on what is Alrighty. the well, funniest so before we move on quickly subscribe to if you haven't if you're listening to this and you yeah. haven't subscribed to the channel flip and yeah, do that yeah. now if you've we got this far i mean it's been like an hour yeah. probably if you've got this far at subscribe. least yeah we've yeah. been going at this for a while okay this is the final question so you okay. better be ready for this one what is the funniest story you have related to running? It can be during a race or, I mean, you've organized many a race, so it could be something about someone else. Um, but just a really memorable <laughs> moment <laughs> that you have that. from a trip. Yeah, obviously don't yeah, expose a... probably uh, <laughs> people that come to your race. I've got some stories. I've got some stories. This is an incredibly hard. It doesn't have to be me. So it can be from an impact race. That, yeah, that yeah, yeah, it can be, it can be. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can't think of like anything that lives up to what should be a really funny moment. I think the most, well, no, okay. So the moment that I had complete disbelief was we were organizing a race for, for someone else um, in Northern Kenya. Yeah. And um, there'd been a lot of like the Kenyan woo, um, uh, rainy season had gone on a, a little bit extra. And we'd had to reroute a lot. A bridge had been taken down and by, by by flash floods and all this sort of it doesn't sound funny at the moment does it um and so there was a lot of flooding happening in the area and every time we went out it was me and myself and a race director called abby and we were heading out on our motorbikes every day every single day because there was no rain in that area that was mm. happening right what was happening was 200 kilometers away more summit if it rained on this side 
a river that went this way through our race course would flood. So yeah. there was different flood points. If we went through this side, a different race, a uh, different river would flood. So uh, we plotted out, okay, cool. When, when it rains that side, this, these two points become flood points on our race course. Can we get our medics across? Can we get, um, can we get across and, and all of that? So we'd planned yeah. everything. And when we're planning a race route, especially in a location like that, we play the what if game a lot. Both the positives, like what if we did this cool, really thing, you know, rewritten it that way so they get that view. But also like, what if we can't get the medic vehicle across that section of the course, you know? So we have plan A, B, C, D, E, and anyone who's been in Pan Marathon knows that, you know, we don't tell you which plan we're going with pretty much till the race briefing the night before, because that's just the reality of, of, of where we, where we organize yeah. our events. And so we got to the point, it was race day morning, and the day before we'd gone across our, uh, the, the, our most high risk area, we'd gone across it, and it's like, cool. So I'd be in the pickup truck, and Abby would jump out, and she'd walk six meters this way, six meters that way, just to check, because under the water, you don't know if there's a big drop. There. So she would check that, and then I'd drive across behind her. Um, why she got that job, that sounds a bit unfair. I should probably have done that job. Anyway, right? she, she quite enjoyed it. She's down from the Ronda Valley in Wales. Like, she was a tough tough cookie and she really enjoyed this right so she's in charge now of getting the medics across to their their point and the flood is there hasn't been any further rain so she gets to the water point she's like cool and the driver's like okay cool you know um i don't think we can cross here she's like no don't worry i've got this she starts rolling up her trousers doing this, what we've done the whole time jumps in and they're like abby get in the car and she's like no no it's fine i've been doing this all the time and um like that was a great Welsh accent. They said, no, I feel I did it, did it, did it come off okay? You never know. Really. <laughs> we tried it. Um, and she gets in and she's, she's going six meters. Like, Abby, get in the car, get in the car, stop it. Is this the, the, the local Kenyan drivers? Like, get, get in the car. She's like, whoa, 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 no. And they went, there's hippos. She's like, what? Oh my God. I said, she comes running out, Jonathan's like, there's hippos. And she's like, well, are there always hippos? Yeah, there's hippos every day. Like, why has nobody told us this? She's like, through the, the, every night the hippos come to this point. No, we we, we wrecked this course like 10, 15 times. No one's ever said there's there's hippos at this point. And she's like, okay. So, but 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 and the light is it going to be better? And they were like, oh no. And I went into Welsh accent for the Kenyan now. I'm not going to try Kenyan accent. I'm not going to. do They were like, no no no. It, in the day they just hide in the bushes, like. <laughs> wow. you can imagine the hippo when is a hippo hiding you can imagine, like, she, and so she just calls me up she goes you're never going to believe this and so i was like cool well we knew that, that place could flood so plan b it is and she just moved into plan b we delayed yeah. the start of the race 15 minutes we didn't tell anybody why we delayed the start of the race until afterwards and um it was a good one to tell them all in the debrief after the race of like why why we'd ended up doing it that way and um yeah it was um it's just a moment i will never forget it's just just i can hear her voice now just being like you won't believe this <laughs> um i'm finding out yeah and we've been there three weeks not a single person had told us we'd never seen a hippo there and it just so happened on race day but you know when you've got all of those plans those those like curveballs mm. come your way it's really um it's, it comes back to that thing about like cool challenge me like cool challenge us you know yeah. um that came in that was certainly um yeah, that was an eventful day. And that, that was a long one because you had people walking it as well, right? Yeah. So um, that was a 44-hour work day. We didn't sleep for 44 hours putting that event on. The pickup truck was moving for 22 hours. I was driving, for, you know, partly because there was also a problem with the engine that if I, if I stalled or if the engine cut out, we had to push start it. So every single time I got to like a speed bump where the pressure was like super on not to go too slow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but partly also because it was, a, yeah, it was just a long day. So yeah, that was a pretty... Um, a pretty cool moment and there's other ones where the monkeys stole our bananas on the race course in kenya a different race course in kenya and i was just like could the monkeys be any more cliche like come on bananas like two weeks earlier we'd had had monkeys break into our kitchen and they'd stolen they'd gone through like our larder we had all sorts of stuff in our larder what have they stolen they stolen the peanuts so i've had peanuts and bananas stolen by the monkeys in, in kenya i'm like Guys, have some creativity, have some imagination. I cooked a, I cooked a lovely spag bowl that was in the bar. Like, anyway. Uh. I think I think that, that definitely lives up to a lot of uh, other <laughs> funny stories that we've had. So anyway, thank you so much for giving up hey, your thank time. You. I know you've got quite a busy schedule with um, your wedding coming up. So also big congratulations mm. um, thank you. for the next coming, coming days. And obviously have a great Christmas. Um, yeah. Thank you everyone for watching awesome. the show and 
We'll see you next week. Bye.